sanity check. Everybody can see it. Okay. Yes. And sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Fantastic. So, hello. I'm Jeff Porton. I'm the executive director of Student Publish USA. Um, the title of this talk is "Ethics in STEM Careers to Make It Fit the ST Global uh, Environment." Um, but if I was describing student pugwash in general, uh, I would refer to it as ethics in STEM everywhere. Uh, we serve multiple communities in our outreach, uh, bringing new ways of thinking about STEM and ethics in STEM. Um, we work with students and young professionals who are both working in STEM fields or planning to work in STEM fields, um, but also people in other disciplines and issue areas who will be considering all sorts of science and technology issues as citizens and when they vote and as leaders in their communities. Uh, so I like to phrase it as we're ethics and STEM for e English majors, as well as pre-professionals um, or pre-academics, or I suppose uh, pre-professional academics. Um, so a description of what Pugwash is, Student Pugwash is founded to model after the Pugwash Conferences on Science and World Affairs uh, those are annual meetings of scientists, policymakers, and, and uh, diplomats, uh, you know, politicians who are meeting on security threats, especially on existential threats. And because of the WMD relationship when they founded the organization, uh, that scientific and technolog technological threats are key to what they do. Uh, they shared the Nobel Peace Prize in 1995 with Joseph Rotblatt, who was the longtime president and one of the founders of the organization. Uh, student Pugwash, we model after Senior Pugwash, which is our nickname for it. Um, we're, all, we're an international network of students and young professionals working on similar issues. Uh, you'll notice the board of, uh, uh, of, of Student Pugwash USA is a bit older than students, but um, some Student Pugwash groups are run by alumni and some Student Pugwash groups are run uh, by their active members. And all of them are decentralized in that the uh, individual students have a great deal to say in terms of what the organization is doing. Uh, student Pugwash USA is part of the International Student Young Pugwash Network, uh, which is the over the umbrella group for all of the national student pugwash groups around the world. And I think there's, uh, if you include places where there's interest, uh, you know, probably 20 or 30 of them. There's, we're, 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 we're pretty much global. So the Senior Pugwash organization was founded after the Russell Einstein Manifesto in 1955, uh, which, is, uh, which called for scientists to assemble in conference uh, to appraise the perils as a result of weapons of mass destruction and to discuss a resolution to that problem. Uh, we're speaking not as members of a nation, continent, or creed, but as human beings whose continued existence is in doubt. Uh, here then is the problem which we present to you, stark and dreadful and inescapable. Shall we put an end to the human race or shall mankind re renounce war? And I'll add here that uh, the Pugwash Conferences are not a pacifist organization. Um, they work with many people in the military to reduce the existential threats that stem from war. Uh, but there's a strong realization that any war can escalate to be larger than the participants intended when they started, as we have numerous examples throughout history. Uh, so this to me is the, is the moving closing of the manifesto. Uh, there lies before us if we choose continual progress in happiness, knowledge, and wisdom. Shall we instead choose death because we cannot forget our quarrels? We appeal as human beings to human beings, remember your humanity and forget the rest. And then you see the 11 people who signed the manifesto. Uh, so this is, this is the mission of student Pugwash. Uh, we have a wider... Uh, remit. We cover all ethics and science and technology with a special focus on what senior Pugwash covers. Uh, and so I had a question come in before the, the, the talk started. Uh, what's unique about us compared to other STS groups? Uh, we're not in competition with other STS groups. We intend to cooperate with them. Um, our funding is membership driven, so we're not in competition uh, with your organizations. And when your group does something that's mission-centric for us, we'll promote it as if it's one of our projects. We don't have a, a not invented here policy. If, um, if you're with an, a student organization that's doing something that's Pugwash related, uh, we will certainly uh, co-sponsor it and promote it as if we invented it here. Um, we reach out to broad communities uh, from high school on up, and we have a general membership society for anybody who's no longer a student. Uh, and we speak layperson. We, we, you know, we wanna be for English majors 
if we're presenting it, we present advanced topics sometimes and we have uh, deep dives into many issues, uh, but we try to speak it in plain English so that people don't need to be PhD students in a topic to follow along what's being presented. Uh, although obviously to just the audience. And the other thing that is unique is that we're part of the Pugwash movement and we've been around since 1979. Uh, we are a uh, long running organization that's had pretty good impact over the years and we're looking to extend that and, and uh, improve upon it uh, as we go forward. Uh, this is why we're all named Pugwash. The first Pugwash conference that the seniors held was in Pugwash, Nova Scotia, a small town of about a thousand people during the summer and maybe a hundred people during the winter. And you can tell because of their uh, latitude. Um, and they got so used to calling it the Pugwash conference that first in the first two years that they just adopted the name. So I will now turn it over to the speakers. Uh, we have a solid lineup today. So I'm gonna skip reading you their bios except what's listed here. Uh, but everybody here except Tony is the first result in Google. So if you want more background and bios, uh, just toss your names into Google in a side window uh, and you'll get more information. Um, if you'll post your Q&A in the talk, Rajiv and I will be watching the, for questions and we will curate those as we go. So Charlissa, over to you. As soon as I stop sharing. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlissa Moore. I'm an assistant professor at Michigan State University and James Madison College. Really happy to be here, but I will notice note that I was fortunate enough to receive my second COVID vaccine yesterday, and I'm not feeling off awesome, so bear with me. Um, so I want to talk about the STEM pipeline model and how it relates to operationalizing individual and social responsibility. So I'm a, a leaker from the STEM pipeline. I did my undergraduate in astronomy and physics, and then I went on to do my master's and PhD in STS in science policy, essentially the human and social dimensions of science and technology program at Arizona State University. So I wanna think a little bit about this pipeline and what it means. Uh, typically it's a, it's a linear pipeline. Uh, we think about shoveling people in on one end um, and trying to retain them all the way out through uh, this, this one stops at majoring in STEM, but often we think about it all the way up to the PhD and professorial level. And um, I leaked from this pipeline because I felt that living a career that was personally fulfilling and socially responsible re required me to do so. And I wanna talk more about that and why I think this metaphor has a lot of drawbacks. And I'm gonna refer a couple times to some interviews that I conducted a few years ago with uh, 25 student Pugwash alums about their career experiences related to student Pugwash, but I'm not going to give a formal research talk. So uh, this is a picture from Nature Jobs from a couple of years ago. Um, and the, ar the argument of this article is that we need to do a better job supporting women. And I would add women of color and people of color within the STEM pipeline. Um, instead, we're kind of focusing on shoveling people in on one side of the pipeline and not paying attention to uh, the implications later on in the pipeline in terms of um, women's experiences and people of color's experiences um, in academia and in STEM careers. And I mean STEM careers quite broadly here. So what is the relationship between this kind of model and how we think about social responsibility? So I wanna think about that from two different perspectives. One is the perspective of personal responsibility and one is the scale of institutional and social responsibility. And I've tried to portray that in this upside down pyramid here. So on the personal responsibility level, I use Joseph Herkert's term microethics and microethics operates at the individual level of personal morality and belief systems. It often gets operationalized in STEM fields as don't fabricate, falsify or plagiarize. I also wanna to add to this uh, one's personal vocation and fulfillment because I think um, what's wrong partially with this linear pipeline model is that careers are just not that unidimensional um, and people's needs and people's personal goals um, will be much more successful if we focus on our own uh, personal fulfillment coupled with social responsibility than if we try to follow a prescribed linear path. So um, further 
out in the scale is the idea of institutional and social responsibility. So the concept of macroethics from Joseph Herkert is the collective social responsibility to the profession and to societal decisions about technology. And Brad Allen B from also from ASU um, defines this even more broadly. So ethics applied to complex, large scale anthropogenic systems in which outcomes are highly uncertain. So try to portray this by going from the individual to the career and employer level, out to the policy con context, all the way up to these large scale socio-technical systems. So part of what I wanna argue is that a responsible career is not archetypal um, and it's not linear. So um, as admirable as these archetypal stereotypes are, it's not the only way of living out a socially responsible career. So Joseph Rotblatt, who um, Jeff just mentioned, exited the Manhattan Project um, after working there for a while in 1944, after he overheard Leslie Groves say that the bomb could be used against the Russians and not um, against the Germans. And he said, that's not what I'm here for. I can't stand for that. And he was the only scientist to leave the Manhattan Project in protest. And I think that's a very inspiring, um, very exciting story. And I've heard a number of stories like this from other Pugwash alum. Um, but I wanna also acknowledge that the Rutblatt story and other major role change stories are motivating, but not the only pathway. So one thing we found when we talked to student Pugwash alum is that some of them actually felt kind of discouraged by this story and felt that um, they were not living a socially responsible career because they hadn't made a big choice like this. So one person said, I've never had to choose to do or not do something based on my conceptions of whether it was socially responsible or not. So they had really internalized this idea that social responsibility was fundamentally tied to the institution for which they work. Um, so kind of one step up from the micro level. And particularly people who are working careers in the pharmaceutical industry or the defense industry saw that their career wasn't um, socially responsible because it didn't match an ideal institution type for working toward social responsibility. Um, and when we went further in the interviews, we really found that uh, many of these people were taking stands in their company for what was right. They were creating discussion groups. They were very focused on ensuring that they had leadership um, who would enact social responsibility. So um, I think that having a responsible career is more than just your organizational type. It's not a pristine vision of what a responsible versus an irresponsible organization is. But then the tricky part is neither is a divorce from the institutions of society because we have to work to change them and we often have to work within the context of them. So I also think that one issue with this linear STEM pipeline is that it doesn't acknowledge the dynamism of responsibility. And um, it kind of takes this approach of consequentialism that the individual is responsible for taking actions that improve the future condition of society from a utilitarian perspective, which also requires predicting how one's actions will affect a socio-technical system in the future. And since these systems are very dynamic, um, since they change constantly, and sen since while we can anticipate certain things, they're difficult to predict with certainty, um, I think living a responsible career is more about making day-to-day -day um, day -day decisions that help us um, kind of align our career with what is socially responsible at the micro and the macro equity. Um, ethical levels. And in many ways, responsibility is contextual. It's shaped by culture. It's shaped by resource scarcity um, and a variety of other measures. So one of the medical doctors we talked to in this study um, worked sometimes as an MD in an urban area and sometimes in an indigenous community and in a rural remote community. And he talked about how what a responsible decision was in those two different contexts was greatly different. So first of all, this, this linear pipeline model just doesn't take into account that dynamism. And I think a, pa a career pathway is much more a, a winding weaving path. And we, we don't think on a frequent basis about how to enact um, social responsibility and, and personal fulfillment and micro, micro ethics that we sometimes 
uh, would lose sight of that goal. Um, your life inside institutions matter too. And I think as we think about our positionality and how different people have widely different experiences in institutions, that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, and one thing you'll need to think about for those who are students is whether you want to work from the inside or outside of organizations. I think both are um, very wonderful goals and both are you know, different or more appropriate for different people. I think it's also really important to think about um, a company or an organization's diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. Um, we see many cases in which DEI, DEI is only a token within an organization, and even universities often use discourses of liberal multiculturalism to substantiate the organization's existence and even its wrongdoings. Um, and so looking for organizations that have a genuine commitment to DEI, I think is part of living a socially responsible career. And this has to be judged not from the organization's uh, discourse uh, from the leadership, but from the most marginalized people working in the organization or in the company. Um, I also wanna point out that our interviewees largely saw formal rules as useless um, for guiding responsible innovation and responsible action. Um, so they needed to be there, but they weren't really the determining factors. Um, institutional culture and leadership were far bigger, um, played far bigger roles. And I found that as well in my career. Um, in, so Grinbaum and Grove say, we affirm that responsible innovation cannot simply be a matter of following a fixed set of professional rules. So there's some guidance from this um, in our SCS literature as well. But I think also pipeline linking doesn't necess necessitate living a precarious career. It's a set of personal decisions that prioritize your personal goals, which can certainly include your children and your family. If your only motivation is money, I'm not sure that I could, could help with guidance with that. But um, you know, if you've really thought through your personal morality and goals, I think it's perfectly fine to prioritize those. I think that continuously questioning what responsible what responsibility means to you and to society and how to operationalize this is fundamental to a socially responsible career and it's also dynamic and that's why this pipeline model alone doesn't work it's really imperative that those of us engaging in this praxis between micro and macro ethics and careers and personal vocation shouldn't just be seen as kind of the detrius at the bottom of this pipeline, or in this case, sort of problematically the le leaking pink goo from the sides of the pipeline. So I suspect that some of my colleagues will have more concrete um, discussions about their personal choices, but I wanted to give us as a starting point, a framework for thinking about these things in a somewhat theoretical way. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Charlissa. That was an excellent framework. Um, uh, next up is Tony Bradshaw from Matheson. Let me unmute myself. All right, let's see how this works here. Okay, are you seeing that? Yep, you're all excellent. good. Okay, very good. Okay, so um, we did not do a, a straight man routine on this, but I, uh, I think Charlisa's uh, uh, intro was was going to help me a lot. Then, so this is this is a very concrete example, I think, of of something that that certainly that I went through. So, so this is uh, this is my tagline for for today's talk. Okay, and hopefully by the end you'll understand it. Okay. All right, so as you see from our panel, um, I'm a little bit different in that I am working in industry. I've worked in industry basically since uh, leaving undergrad. Um, I did go back for, for a master's, but it was, it was very technical and, and, and very associated with my work. Um, and to the, to the question or to the point, you know, when, when I was leaving undergrad and going to work in some regards, partly because of pugwash, I almost felt like a like a sellout, right? And and I think you, you we hear that at times, right? Um, 
but you know the, the the diagram here is just kind of you know to show I, I found something that really interested me okay the the you know from a mechanical engineering perspective getting to work with you know 10,000 horsepower compressors and cryogenics on top of it was you know was pretty unique and, and a lot of fun so so it's been a great career I, I don't regret any part of it um, when I was an undergrad I did help lead our student uh, pugwash chapter um, at my school, I was also a student member of the board then as well. Okay, so a little background, and you, you can ask more if you need to. Okay, so I love little diagrams as well. Um, they're simplistic, but you can you know you you can work with them. This is one that you know I I, I use one coming up that uh, that works well in business. And so when I found this one. In, in in Google that that had very similar sort of methodology where you know ethics is the center of the conversation and depending on what you want to argue you can put in different morals around the sides it it, it lent very well to this I thought so let's see if you feel the same way at the end um, so what happens here is I take the, the 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 pyramid that we just showed and this is this bottom one here is a translation then to what in, you know, is very, very common speak in business and, and industry, right? So depending on, I'm a projects guy, okay? So I've, I've done projects pretty much all my career, whether they're building plants or software projects or whatever the case may be. So you always have, you know, scope, time, cost, constraints. And I always put the resource element into this because one of the main things is whatever way you sort of squeeze that balloon on the, on the other three, the resource is really almost always caught in the middle as well. And, and, and that's kind of important to, you know, to realize and, and work with as you go forward. Um, now, I'm going to take a gross liberalization of, of the uh, substitution principle here, and I'm going to change resource, not just to people right, and, and humanize it, but then also say by going up here, it, this conversation is about people's safety. All right. And that, that's really what, what this talk is about for me. Okay. All right, so somewhat dramatic in, in the headline, but it is true and, and it happens in, in business and industry and, and in a chemical industry and a lot of uh, you know, dangerous processes. It happens daily, right? Um, so to be very specific in, in, in what I was talking about here is we, we install a lot of oxygen delivery systems. So these are, they can be gaseous systems, but a lot of times for me, they're cryogenic systems. We have cryogenic liquid oxygen and we put systems in at hospitals, of course. So you end up getting your, your, your hospital, your, your, um, you know, your breathing air. Um, they go into pulp and paper, steel mills, float glass, a lot of different industries. Okay. These systems are dangerous. They're inherently dangerous. Um, oxygen is, is, is a wonderful thing, obviously. We wouldn't be here, but with very minor changes to, to its uh, characteristics, it, 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 it becomes dangerous in, in pressure and everything else. And so when you design a system, you've got a lot to take into consideration. I'm going to kind of focus here on, on the ones that are in red, um, which is the impurities in a, in a system. Um, and that when I talk about impurities, this can be things like particles, just purely a, a you know a piece of of uh, the metal coming out of a pipe um, that the system is built with. It can also be foreign impurities such as um, especially hydrocarbons that get introduced into a system. Okay, that happens to be one of the most common situations if there is an incident with any of these systems that really in the, in the postmortem you come back to and you find out, oh, you know, the, maybe the system wasn't cleaned as well as it should have been, or maybe it wasn't designed as well as it should have been to account for something that happened with a release of a particle, something like that, okay? And then focusing here on the black light inspection. So if you, if you, if you take a piece of pipe and you put a black light on it in a dark environment and it glows, um, means you have hydrocarbons in it and those hydrocarbons with oxygen will react and that will allow the you end up with a, a fire pyramid basically and it, it it ends up that the system will fundamentally consume itself if if it can okay this is a very um subjective 
method when you're actually out there, you know, doing an inspection. So when, when, as a person, as an engineer or, or, a, or an inspector or somebody, when you're out at doing a job inspection, you know, you get guidance on this and there are, there are procedures to test and you can get tested on it, but there's a, basically at the end of the day, you, you say, I pass on this, right? This is going to, this is going to go, uh, go forward. And let's say we're doing that on, on a valve. Well, here, when, when you put that valve then into service or get it prepared for service, you tag that valve and you say, that's clean for oxygen service. And that's where this comes from, right? Is you, you have to be able to say with a good conscience, that's ready to go. Otherwise, basically, you would be putting people in harm's way next because if that component isn't ready to be used in the system, it may cause some a situation that will kill people down the line. So that's that's kind of the, the the backdrop for all of that. Oops, sorry. Okay, so obviously doing the designs on paper for this are are what is done. It's very important. You have to dedicate your time and your energy to that, and 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 you do that as a professional. Um, the thing that was very very different, in, and I say something that I did not expect for me going into. Um, industry was I didn't end up expecting to have a team of people reporting to me, right? I mean, a lot of times as an engineer, we're co individual contributors to a project or, or, or doing calculations or something like that. But I basically ended up uh, very quickly getting a team of people reporting to me, building such systems. And all of a sudden, you know, even, even though we have very regimented procedures and everything else, you know, when, when, when the people have to go home, at night safely, you know, it doesn't, it's not a slogan anymore. It's not a, it's not a procedure anymore. It's, you know, it, it's in your, for me, it was in my gut, right? Then it took on a whole different meaning. Um, and, and that was really the thing that, that changed a lot of, how do I want to say the way I looked at the way I was doing things. It's not necessarily that I was doing anything that I regret and it wasn't, the design was still the same, but making sure that before that system came online, I could sit there with my personal litmus test at night, sleeping well and everything else and say, yeah, I'm good with this. Right. Um, so that, that was, that was pretty much one of the kind of defining moments for me in my career that, you know, that didn't involve just me. It didn't involve just a piece of paper and a design. Right. How does that come back then though, to some of the conversation we have about pug wash? Well, I mean, we certainly never had a symposium or anything else on oxygen safety when we were doing our uh, when we were doing our pug wash events or anything like that. We also didn't have a you know a, a talk on personnel training or anything like that either. Um, but what you do is you know you get exposed to a lot of other people. You get exposed to a lot of other topics when you're leading a chapter or you go to an event that you may not otherwise get exposed to, right? And again, probably not going to be oxygen safety, but what it is, is it's a way for you to sit there, contemplate, maybe you're not even involved, maybe you're just passively sitting in the audience, um, but maybe you're a participant on a panel, right? You get to think in different ways. We all, that's one of our you know, most favorite lines, right? Or, or quotes. Um, you also foster discussions with other people, but you also can foster discussions for people that may not have been able to do it themselves. And that's one of the other big things that I think we accomplished, you know, when we were doing, you know, uh, events was some of the people loved the events. Some of the people really wanted to hear what, uh, you know, the panel discussions were saying, but they couldn't, they weren't going to do it themselves. They didn't have the means. They, they didn't have maybe the, the, the motivation to do it, but because we or other organizations are out there, you get that. And that's very important. I feel right. Um, and, and that's the piece that, that for me, you know, again, there was no unique conversation about, you know, talking about people's, you know, going home safely at night in, in a work environment. But because you can put the different dots together, it, there was, you know, there was no sort of, I didn't have to think twice when, when we, you know, when we got put in that situation, you know, are we going to, are we going to pass on this when we're not all 100% sure that this is right? No. And it was just a buildup over time. And I think one of the key things is, you know, you don't, there isn't just a switch that gets flipped for every situation you're going to be in, in life with regards to making a decision or that. And I think it's nice that if, you know, as a student, a young adult, whomever, 
you get exposed to these different topics and different elements, you can then pull that together and, and it builds your per personal portfolio of litmus tests that you can use when something does come up. That's how I say, all right, are you comfortable enough putting that sticker on at the end of the day that it's ready to go? Thanks. That was it. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, next speaker is Dan Sklaru. Dan, we have your slide, but I don't see your video yet. Are you? If you're talking, you might be muted. I sound much better muted, actually. But if you want to actually see my mug and hear me, I'll try that. Sorry. Let me do my first slide again. Uh, student Pugwash Think Ethically Serve Professionally is what I'm focusing on today. And in Strelos's turn, I'm trying to not be an archetype, but an example um, of the process. So I got involved with Student Pugwash um, about uh, 35 years ago almost. Um, at, at University of Pennsylvania. I uh, lived the chapter there. Here's a picture of our moderator there in the front and center, I think, um, doing some pretty cool dances. Uh, and, uh, and I also started uh, chapters at the subsequent universities I went to at Boston University and um, George Mason University. And the commonality is we were always asking kind of why, why do we have a big nuclear arsenal? Why are we allowing the environment to get degraded? Why are we accepting that there's disease in the world and, and what can we do about these things and that was a really exciting thing to be thinking about as a freshman in college and ever since um and then we got to go to cool places like um atlanta georgia uh, uh san diego um and a picture behind our house jeff is uh pugwash nova scotia where the first conferences on science and world affairs occurred and um and talk about these issues with people who you know may have generally agreed with us or have some differences and every now and then we had some really amazing experiences like I had a student who was a certified Nazi and he was in there in the class to talk to me about how he viewed things and, and he was willing to respect others perspectives and as a result everyone was able to really reflect on well, what does it mean to be a fascist and you know how am I different than that and how are my ethics conflict with that in a way that was allowing us to not fight with each other but really try to understand different perspectives so that diversity was really important to me. I um, too took a lot of um, inspiration from the uh, Einstein Russell manifesto which I read for the first time as a freshman in college and have returned to many times before, or since then rather, thinking about uh, thinking in a new way, aiming to focus our work at towards happiness, um, knowledge and wisdom, and also remembering our humanity at all points, which seems to be a point that is just as salient today as it was in 1955. I was also inspired by the second declaration which came out of the Pugwash conferences in 1988, uh, during my sophomore year, which was really um, that we have to think about how environmental degradation weakens all, and that um, we have to find sustainable development in all regions of the world, and also that education plays an important role in trying to preserve our uh, life support on, on this planet. And from that, um, those experiences, I kind of had a, some ethical guidance to carry into my future um, career, but then this thing came along through Student Pugwash USA called the Pugwash Pledge, and I not only was the, one of the early people to sign this, but I had it laminated and had it in my wallet for many, many years until it fell apart, even the lamination. I promise to work for a better world where science and technology are used in socially responsible ways. I will not use my education for any purpose other than uh, intended to harm human beings or the environment. Throughout my career, I will consider the ethical implications of my work before I take action. And while the demands paced on me may be great, I sign this declaration because I recognize that I that individual responsibility is the first step on the path to peace. And it, I have to say, I live this, you know, I mean, I try my best to live this at least. This is really something that I think uh, our colleagues at, at Student Pugwash USA who put this together really captured the way I was feeling and I continue to feel throughout my career um, as an ethically driven um, professional. Now, where does that matter? Well, I went to, to do a PhD program at Boston, Boston University in neural networks, and I found out that my colleagues were all designing missile guidance systems or stock market prediction systems, or even better, um, samples what might go into the Terminator's head in a few years uh, if we actually had the Skytel uh, catastrophe that was that was talked about in that movie. And I didn't really want to do that with neural networks, so I ended up doing a master's project looking at 
how we can better see um, predict drought in um, West Africa based on remote sensing uh, of each pixel, whether it's green enough early in the rainy season to indicate things are okay, or if it's brown would indicate we'd have to get food um, to that community uh, because there were crops weren't growing fast enough. And that was a really neat application of neural networks. So I wasn't ready, I would, that alone probably wouldn't have made me leave uh, my PhD program at Boston um, since I found something was a value, but then I encountered what I would call an ethically toxic graduate program. So that included misrepresenting risk. I had faculty would basically um, talk about risk in a way that um, they would talk to one uh, possible subject in one way, another possible subject, and they tell them if they were a lawyer, they try to chase them off so they didn't want to be part of their studies. Basically, they tried to fake uh, risk in a way that would uh, allow certain people to be exposed to radiation and others not based on their, their uh, professional status. I also saw in my classes examples of torturing animals to the point where I'd get sick after class. Um, and it was very upsetting to me to see a psychoneuroendocrinology class do the sorts of things they were doing to animals just to understand our human sexuality. And finally, perhaps the last straw was as a part of a student pug pugwash event that I helped organize, we did a hunger banquet to raise hunger for um, aid in uh, Somalia, or, sorry, for famine in Somalia. And my advisor, when I went in for my next research meeting with her, she brought out this, this newspaper article and showed it to my face and said, this is not why you're in grad school. What are you doing here? You know, you should not be involved with these student events. You should be doing your research that we're paying you to do. And stifling that compassion and showing an absolute disregard for my humanity pretty much put me into tears and made me think this is the time to exit this graduate program. So I left with a master's degree and a study leave and went to George Mason University to work on my environmental science and policy PhD, I'm sorry, environmental biology and public policy uh, PhD. From there, I ended up working with a consulting group, Morasco Newton Group, where we got off several days, sorry, several hours a week we could dedicate towards social service and get paid for it. And then I went to SAIC, a company that focused on environmental and other solutions to uh, scientific solutions to social problems, at least in the unit that I was working with at Environment and Health. And that led to a position at the United Nations where I was working on international waters management issues um, for about eight years before being recruited back to George Mason into the program from which I uh, did my PhD. My approach since then has really been focusing on uh, thinking about how can we get students involved with, with actively advancing sustainability in their research education and, and professional lives. And uh, many of you may recognize this is UN Sustainable Development Goals here. All the ones that have a little green uh, highlight around them are ones that I feel like either in my teaching or my research or my service, I've been able to give, make my own small impact um, towards those uh, sustainable development goals over the period of my career. So no, no great hurrahs, no, nothing like Rothblatt where we'll remember it for a generation, but I do feel like I've been able to contribute in a meaningful way. And thank God I quit that job, that position at BU. Just to give you the last two slides, to give you a sense of what that looks like today for me. I'm teaching a course this semester on ecological justice, where we talk about how can we equitably distribute environmental risks and benefits? Does nature have rights? Can wildlife teach us about justice? And how can environmental scientists make sure that uh, we learn from and benefit everyone? And this was the first day of class where we did a, a jam board. Students talked about what justice was to themselves, and we started that our, converse, our conversation like that. So I'm really trying to live it um, you know, decades after having first been exposed to student bug watch. And I've also been asked to try to assess our university, our department for how well our students are learning about uh, the ethics with respect to our profession. And what I found is we have absolutely no way to measure that. And so I feel myself going back to um, student pugwash and the pugwash pledge to think about what is the ethical framework in which we should be expecting our students to be developed, at, to develop as environmental scientists. And then looking at other um, codes of ethics from organizations that are related to our field and trying to integrate that into an assessment framework is literally what I'm doing this week in my job. So I'm very happy to share that with you. And thank you very much. Please help save the earth. Excellent, thank you, Dan. Um, and just to let people know, I'll have more to say about the pledge at the end of the talk. Uh, next up is Natalie Goldring. Hi, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I do not have slides, so when uh, Dan closes off his sharing. People get the screen back a little bit more. Um, I th have three parts to what I want to talk about today. One is my background and my work. The second is my relationship with student pugwash. And the third is suggesting some things for you to think about as you continue in your careers 
along the way, I'll try to respond to a few of the points that my colleagues have made in their presentations. So how did I get here? Well, like many of us, my resume looks much neater from the outside than it's ever felt by the, from the inside. Uh, I went to Wellesley College. I ended up there because I applied early decision. I had had a disastrous interview. Uh, my male parent was excited about the school. I applied, assumed I wouldn't get in, and then I could figure out where I wanted to go to college. Uh, the fates had a different perspective on that. Uh, I went to the Kennedy School for my master's really because I knew that I wanted to go to MIT for my PhD. And when I looked at the Defense and Arms Control program at MIT, the people who were finishing that program and getting their PhDs generally had either a background in physics or a background in quantitative methods. I had a background in political science and American studies and English. Uh, those didn't seem like a great match. So that's why I went there. And I ended up at MIT in part because I met a wonderful person named Ted Greenwood over his family's Thanksgiving table early on in my undergraduate career, who was fascinated by issues of science and technology and defense and arms control and how we could make better policies that would in fact make the world a better place. And I found his approach compelling and he eventually wound up being my dissertation advisor. In terms of my career path, I've spent most of my time with a combination of work in non-governmental organizations and in academe, but I made a deliberate decision not to go on the academic, you know, postdoc to uh, visiting instructor to assistant professor to seeking tenure, because I had been in school straight on since first grade at that point, and I wanted to be doing the policy work and not teaching about things that I had never really done myself. I was advised at the time that if you got off the academic track, it would be very, very hard to get back on it. Uh, I think in a lot of fields, it's, it's simply impossible because they're still so traditionally structured according to those steps. And so I teach, but I teach as an adjunct. And I've had the flexibility to do that. I don't necessarily recommend that as a career path. Ironically, my work in nonprofits has been more stable from the perspective of uh, supporting myself. But I sort of jokingly titled this talk, Neither Fish Nor Fowl, because a lot of academics think I'm a policy wonk and a lot of policy wonks think I'm an academic. And I'd argue I'm in fact both and that it's possible to do that and much of the most interesting work in the world today comes at these intersections of different fields, different topics, and different approaches to, to the issues of today. I've been attracted to cross-cutting issues throughout my career. And so I tend to resist being put into narrow uh, categories. And I think that if we look at the issues of the world, you find that the most important issues tend to be incredibly multidimensional and cannot be solved. And I don't use absolutes very often, but can't be solved simply by looking at them in one direction. So looking at climate change, it has political dimensions, legal ones, military, economic, social, ethical, um, environmental. If you address any one of those, you may be able to help but you're not gonna solve the problem. And so we need people from a variety of perspectives with a variety of approaches who aren't simply thinking in straight ahead, narrow ways. And, and here I agree completely with Charlissa. There is a tendency to try and reduce the world to these very neat models. The world doesn't tend to function that way. And so that's one of the issues that, you know, I would suggest to you is worth a lot more uh, thought and consideration. And it actually bridges very well to my relationship to student pugwash because we kind of grew up together. Uh, student pugwash started when I was in grad school. And I, I remember discovering it for the first time and thinking, yeah, that's what I've been trying to do. I mean, some friends and I put together an ethics curriculum at the Kennedy School. You'd think they'd already have one, but they didn't. And they thought that if, if necessary, these issues could be addressed in the intercession in January. So you did all of your semester courses with no ethical lens whatsoever. And then you had a couple of days to talk about it before the next semester started. And so we developed a set of supplemental case materials to go along with 
what we were being taught in the program. And we had the support of a couple of the founders of the program, which of course made a huge difference. Uh, so student pugwash was doing the same kinds of things. It was calling on students to bring an ethical lens to their consideration of policy issues and of their career. When I was in grad school, most of my classmates, both at the Kennedy School and at MIT, seemed to be largely focused on how to amass power rather than how to use it ethically. And student pugwash took a different approach. Uh, something I don't think people have talked about as much today is that I was also really drawn to the community that you had students developing and leading programs. Uh, you had students taking responsibility for their learning and for the learning of others. It wasn't simply a top down, you know, uh, you know, uh, professor at the front of the classroom uh, lecturing people. And it, it seems almost quaint now, but Student Pugwash was founded on the idea that science matters and that facts matter. And I think that the biggest contribution for me was really supporting my inclination to work at the intersection of different issues, because I could see people doing that. I could see models of people who are chapter advisors and the like, who actually had that kind of approach in their work. And I could see that the students who were active in student pugwash worked on a huge range of issues and had diverse backgrounds. Okay, so things to think about. Um, uh, one point from the other talks, uh, I have left a job on principle uh, and it was difficult. And I think there were consequences for my career. I also stayed in a program, in my PhD program, um, despite sexual harassment, because I couldn't figure out what my alternatives were. And I didn't make that public at the time. I talked with friends and colleagues uh, privately, but I stayed in the program. And what I tried to do was at least warn women who were coming into the program after me to, to be careful with this individual. And I don't know if I would have done that differently because in that day and age, uh, I don't know that I would have had a career if I had taken that on in that way because he was an established professor and I was a young undergrad. Um, so it is important to think about consequences. Fortunately, there's a lot more support here now uh, for people, but it's these are still difficult to dec decisions to make. And what I encourage you to do in thinking about your career and your ways forward is to bring that ethical lens and to bring an equity lens to your work as well. And that's something that's fairly new for me. I pretty naturally integrated issues of gender and sexual identity into my work, both because of my, my personal circumstances and because of friends and family members. I've done much less work on race and racial equity issues. And that's something I'm working on rectifying. Our field is a very white field my field of uh, defense and arms control. And it is a very male field. And to my knowledge, it is a very uh, cisgender heteronormative field. And uh, that's something that we should be working on. I don't think it's been particularly welcoming to women. Uh, I was the only woman in a 20 year period to finish a PhD program, the PhD program I was in at MIT. Um, again, I think these things are somewhat better now than they were before. Um, and what I encourage you to think about as you go forward is what can you individually do to foster real inclusion and real diversity of thought and of people's backgrounds? Uh, what can you do to influence the programs that you're in to think more about these issues and integrate them into the programs rather than seeing ethics as a separate issue? have it be something that's factored in on a day-to-day -day basis in the program. So people start doing it naturally. It's just there as one of their filters. My filters tend to be, you know, political, legal, military, economic, social, environmental. But what I'm trying now to do, ah, shoot, that's my computer freezing. Um, I'm trying to bring that ethical lens and that equity lens into my day-to-day -day work as well. The question I think is, how do you wanna make a difference in the world? And that can be very small scale and it can be very large scale. Uh, as a faculty member, if I've changed a student's perspective on issues and gotten them to ask better questions 
in the course of a semester, I've done something I think is going to make a big difference because they're going to go off and do their work differently than they would have otherwise. And I'll end with Jeff's point about student pugwash, which is that there's a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of the kinds of issues and approaches and activities that fit within the sort of or under the student pugwash umbrella. You can help shape that future by being involved in student pugwash. And I hope you'll do that. We welcome your involvement. Thanks. Thank you, Natalie. Sorry about the silence. My, I couldn't unmute. Um, uh, last up is Ruben Aronin. Thanks so much, Jeff. And thanks, Natalie, uh, and everyone else who uh, has uh, spoken already. I really appreciated all of all of your comments. Um, let me just my of course, computer doesn't want to cooperate. Can folks see this now? It's coming. It'll it'll yeah, arrive yeah. in a couple of seconds. All right. There we go. Terrific. Um, uh, so my name is Ruben Ronan, and uh, like uh, Jeff and Dan, I've been a uh, student Pugwashian, or whatever our term of art is, uh, since uh, the late 80s and early 90s. And uh, I really appreciated the Pugwash frame of life because I'm not a scientist uh, and, um, and not in the science field. Uh, I'm a uh, environmental advocate um, based in California and have focused on uh, raising awareness uh, and urgency about taking action around climate change, clean energy, and clean transportation issues. Um, probably uh, most importantly, I'm a dad uh, of uh, a couple of uh, STEM kids. My daughter's a junior in high school and uh, she helped to found the first high school robotics team. Um, we're fortunate to have a lead mentor who is involved in the JPL Mars missions and uh, has mentored uh, since middle school uh, time uh, kids to work on this. And I will say the most uh, important thing I could convey to this group that Natalie raised is my daughter is very much wanting to go into a bioengineering field. And even in our robotics world, you can see a bit of the demographics of our team while we try to have a gender balanced team. Um, being a young woman in going through this male dominant field of, uh, you know, continues to be a challenge in uh, the academic and extracurricular setting and the um, helping her through those challenges um, and interactions has been um, interesting and painful to, to be a part of. And here we are in, you know, 2021, and this is still, you know, a real, for her to think about, do I really want to go into this field of study where I'm going to potentially be discriminated against and really have to fight to have a seat at the table um, it is something that concerns me as a, as a person and a parent. Um, I'm going to share with you my journey. Uh, I didn't realize I had Kevin Bacon up on my first slide, but I like to think we're all six degrees away from someone. And um, when I first uh, came to LA in the 90s, I helped to run a Hollywood-based uh, environmental nonprofit organization that used the power of celebrity to help educate the public and policymakers on a range of environmental uh, priorities. Um, and so Kevin Bacon uh, headlined one of our projects that we developed with the Union of Concerned Scientists to uh, help elevate the issue of climate change. And in that prism, back in the quaint days of you know, Kyoto Accords, we were trying to push the idea of you know, the 10 year window to avoid cataclysmic climate impacts. Uh, and Kevin Bacon and other celebrities helped participate in television, uh, movie theater, public service announcements and a, a magazine campaign that we were able to um, uh, push out across uh, a lot of different media forums. Um, one of the best uh, projects I did with uh, the Earth Communications Office that I helped to run was bringing Nobel laureate Dr. Mario Molina with uh, Patrick Stewart and then Vice President Al Gore to talk about how we had, um, science had really helped lay the groundwork um, for solving the ozone hole problem. And we needed to listen to scientists who were telling us um, that there was a, an alarming climate crisis that we weren't uh, really addressing. 
So Pugwash kind of gave me the grounding to not be intimidated by science or scientists and to be a partner in elevating um, the role of science in public policy. Um, here's a campaign that I'm proud of, but as I'll share with you, I have some regrets about. Um, after working for ECHO, I went to work for President Gorbachev's uh, Green Cross International, known as Global Green in the United States. One of the campaigns we ran was getting uh, celebrities to take the hybrid Prius uh, to the Oscars instead of uh, gas guzzling limousines. And uh, that program started right around the first uh, or I guess this would be the second Gulf War. Anyway, folks were very concerned in 03 about um, our dependence on oil as well as uh, environmental uh, impacts. And we were able to um, get a lot of interest in popular culture and shifting people to think about uh, you know, pollution. Um, the cartoon in the top corner will show you uh, how passe uh, riding in Prius and the backlash was this kind of limousine liberal culture of, uh, you know, privileged uh, celebrities who could take any car they wanted to, um, you know, wound up uh, defaulting more often than not back to, you know, town cars and limousines um, after they did a photo op, you know, with a hybrid car. Uh, we used uh, or I worked with a number of celebrities and sports personalities to create public service announcements uh, that feel so quaint now in uh, the uh, you know internet age. But helping to use the power of celebrity to get messages to a wide audience has been a consistent theme of the work that I do. Again, taking scientific data, uh, IPCC reports on climate change that are often inaccessible to most of the public and helping to translate that science into accessible uh, and actionable um, information. This PSA focused on the fact that 150 million Americans um, live within uh, 50 miles of a coastline that's threatened by climate change. After Hurricane Katrina, kind of the uh, 21st century uh, catastrophe that uh, shined a light on uh, climate change impacts on our shores, I helped Global Green Marshall of the celebrity power of Brad Pitt. We also brought President Gorbachev to New Orleans um, to work with community partners in the Ninth Ward uh, that was so devastated to help rebuild green homes. Uh, we, as part of that work, were able to get Louisiana to approve solar panels that were rated for high hurricane winds. There was no ability to put solar on homes prior to Hurricane Katrina because of that threat. Um, but it also, um, illuminated a challenge that I continue to grapple with in my work, which is we were a, a um, white-led environmental organization authentically looking to partner with the African-American community that was looking to recover and rebuild in uh, a, um, a really important community in New Orleans that had been devastated and that had been situated in an incredibly vulnerable place. And um, while we were able to build a showcase uh, home project uh, for the community. Uh, we were very much the, you know, California group coming to save the world in New Orleans without a strong sustainability plan for how we could empower and get funding to the groups on the ground. Um, this was a shot of President Gorbachev coming to New Orleans. Um, my favorite quote that got picked up in Time Magazine from his visit after Katrina was that if New Orleans wasn't rebuilt sustainably within five years, there should be a revolution. Um, the other Pugwashian connection with Global Green is uh, I got to work a little bit on one of those legacies of the Cold War, the terrible chemical weapons depots that and surplus stockpiles that existed in the Soviet Union, the countries of the Soviet Union, um, a quiet but really powerful effort that President Gorbachev helped to lead was the destruction of those stockpiles and American funding for the investment in destroying stockpiles in the US and um, the Soviet Union, uh, a huge terror threat, environmental and humanitarian threat to the world. So now I work for another Pugwashian named uh, company. I've gone to the private sector um, for my family. Nonprofit salary was a little too unstable, um, but I do the closest thing that I can to nonprofit, which is I work for a boutique environmental consulting firm that has public agencies and largely nonprofit groups as our client base. Um, we recently helped to create an electric vehicle campaign called Electric for All 
And our uh, task was to bring local heroes, electric vehicle proponents and drivers from Watts, California, from Oakland, uh, from the Central Valley that have highlighted and created a wonderful van pooling, electric van pool for farm workers program into a campaign headlined by Mark Ruffalo. So integrating celebrity visibility, but with an equity lens on that. Um, and we also do political campaigns. And last year in the COVID crisis, we were able to get um, $800 million uh, redirected from energy efficiency programs in corporate buildings since nobody was working in a corporate building and have that redirected to school investments to make them healthier and more efficient um, for, uh, for school return. A couple of other quick highlights of uh, work that I do. Um, this is a, the picture on the left is uh, Speaker Rendon and other state assembly leaders uh, in California doing a water tour in a community in uh, Los Angeles that uh, is uh, water insecure. Um, they are, that is a brown glass of water that is the water coming out of the ground incredibly polluted and needing state dollars to remediate uh, in another water uh, insecure community in Compton, they're actually using mustard gas to treat uh, water um, and uh, it, the system had totally been dilapidated. So we were highlighting third world condition crises that are happening right here. And then we've created this California Delivers brand on the positive side to highlight all of the important clean energy, climate, clean transportation work that California has led. And in this case, to show the jobs benefits of that um, new economy that we're trying to build up. Uh, I uh, thought I would share that, you know, I guess in ethical considerations, I have some um, regrets about aligning so closely with Toyota, a car company that stood with the Trump administration to sue California uh, and try to strip away our state's unique ability to have more stringent car pollution standards than the federal government, something in, that we have from the Clean Air Act from 50 years ago. Um, and uh, while they had a uh, good energy efficient car, fuel efficient car 20 years ago, Toyota has really been standing in the way of progress. We partnered with some grassroots ad advocates and a great Hollywood digital firm to create a short called uh, Pete the Prius. And if you visit toyotacan'tbetrusted.com, you can check it out there. On the flip side, we are very in, uh, focused on creating an electric truck future. This was former Governor Brown talking at a unveiling of a Frito-Lay plant that uh, had committed to go electric, which is really the focus of our current campaign. The last thing that I will share is in, a, in my work to uh, advance clean transportation solutions and, and live up to California's commitment to get to 100% electric cars and trucks and buses on the road, um, we had left behind the communities most impacted by pollution. And seven of the 10 worst polluted cities and regions in the country are in California. That's been consistent even through the, excuse me, the COVID crisis. Um, we've been lifting up the stories and voices of communities around warehouses adjacent to our ports where 40% of all the goods coming into the United States get uh, put on trucks and into warehouses um, and are uh, creating terrible hardships, air pollution, asthma, uh, and, and causing premature deaths because of the terrible air quality in California. So we're working to lift up those voices um, here's a suite of electric vehicles that we're, uh, pro, that we're excited about and using this to push for policy changes to mandate um, that uh, fleets begin to purchase electric trucks uh, and zero emission truck solutions. The uh, work to help bring clean vehicles, zero emission vehicles to communities, um, we've begun to work with uh, a range of community organizations, BIPOC uh, organizations in San Pedro, right near the LA ports in Pacoima, uh, a largely Latino working class community, the pilot electric vehicle car sharing program so that we can make sure that um, these vehicles are accessible and available to all. Uh, and this is a great shot of a partner for one of our programs in Watts, uh, where they're doing electric vehicle test drives on Earth Day in pre-COVID days anyway. So I know that was a quick run through. I thought I would give my perhaps not so archetypical professional story 
uh, via a pugwash lens that I don't think has always been in the forefront of my actions, but certainly has helped give me an anchor that I can be an advocate for good science and um, connect that to a powerful change, a policy, you know, making change in the world that I'm committed to. Um, like Natalie and others have referenced, our work to be uh, equitable partners and to create space for leadership uh, from communities that are impacted by pollution harms and climate harms the most is uh, where I'm looking to really engage deeply and Better World Group has developed a racial justice practice to help uh, nonprofit organizations, philanthropies and agencies do just that work as well. Thanks so much for the opportunity to join you um, and I will turn off my screen sharing. Thank you. All right, I wanna say thank you very much to the panel. Um, I have a few more uh, a few more slides I'm going to present on uh, how to get involved with student pugwash. Um, but before I do that, I want to just say that um, on the topic of diversity issues, um, we're working with two organizations, I think, that are promoting getting uh, women and young girls involved in security issues. And we're certainly looking to partner with more people, uh, with more organizations on that, because you know, our central focus is not diversity. It's not listed in our mission statement. It's just sort of applied to what we do. Um, talking to organizations that do have central foci on, on different topics, our affiliations with those organizations and our promotion of their events is what um, allows us to have such a breadth of programs. And so we certainly seek out organizations that are overlapping with what we do, but who have a, 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 a central focus that is different from our own. Uh, and I would say that, you know, personally, um, I think of diversity issues when I'm planning something in advance, but when I get stressed, it's something that falls off my radar and that's something that I'm working on. Um, so uh, having people to, that I can personally work with um, that will uh, improve my own actions is something that I'd like to see personally and something that's good for the organization. Um, let me go back into screen sharing. Uh, yes. Um, thank you. Thank you, Jeff, for a wonderful moderate, moderation. And this was the question I was thinking. You know, uh, being having background in environmental science, and now more on the STS uh, so side, how we can get involved, how students can get involved with progress. And let me also remind that we have less time left. Uh, six minutes. We can extend a few minutes, and then in 15 minutes we have. Uh, wrap up of the conference, just for a reminder. And thank you, uh, Jeff, Ruben, Tony, Natalie, Salisha, and Dan for your wonderful presentation. I enjoyed a lot. I have, I might write an email to you. Thank you. Can you still hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, my, my, my computer, for, my computer, my computer locked up when I tried to go into screen sharing. So um, I, I don't know if you can see me or the slide. I'll just, I'll just talk through it. Um, see you we're a membership organization. I'm oh, sorry, say again. Oh, there I was we just go. saying we okay. can see you. Uh, oh, there it came back. We well. Uh, okay. Uh, we can see it. It's going in and out. There you go. Slides are yep. Okay. Yep. That's good. Thank you. Okay. So how to get involved. We are a membership organization like a couple of people said we have, um, uh, we frequently do talks like this, but we also do activist activities such as community education and outreach. Um, I met Dan Skuru when he was standing on a, uh, a, desk, a, a school desk in the middle of Penn campus, basically yelling, learn to think in a new way to a large crowds of people uh, as they walk by uh, and getting people involved with Pugwash. Um, basically we can do any kind of uh, act, uh, uh, outreach um, we can do we can do political activity and and policy lobbying as long as you don't take a political position. So it's perfectly fine just for a pugwash event to or for a pugwash program to reach out to legislators, for example, uh, to promote ethical considerations in, in the work that they do. Uh, as long as we don't say that a Democrat or a Republican is the way to go. Um, so that's the that's the that's that's basically what the five C rules come down to. Um, so we have individual memberships that do this for students for $12. Um, uh, we want you in, if involved now because once, you know, once, once you're involved as a student, um, 
obviously if you're in grad school, that's uh, that's that, that's uh, you know commitment for an open number of years. But after you graduate, there's we have what we call the Rotblatt Society, which is our general membership organization for uh, for non-students, uh, and that's most of our dues come from that. So you you can continue to support us. You can also get, get involved with publish events through the Rotblatt Society as an ongoing thing. Um, we're organizing online communities, event calendars, online databases to share information collaboratively on our, on our website. Uh, and like I mentioned, we have an affiliates network with other organizations working in ST, in STS, uh, and, and basically SciTech in general. Um, so we can provide as best as possible uh, one stop shopping to find events and programs that we're doing, but also that other programs are doing. Uh, we'd also like to talk to, uh, to institutions that are doing, uh, that are teaching in this field, um, have particular aspects of their STS programs that would be uh, worth promoting to our members. Uh, all members are invited to propose new programs. We want to see more of our programs coming out of the grassroots than coming down from the top. Uh, and if you organize an optional chapter at your institution, chapters are able to um, uh, chapters are able to uh, host our own events uh, autonomously. So, very quickly, I have about a minute left. The Pugwash Pledge is ongoing. It is now a course, a brief course of self-guided study. Um, with uh, bi-weekly Zooms for people who are involved in the pledge, they can discuss it with mentors and discuss with each other what the, the questions that they're asking. Um, the pledge test is modifiable, so if you, we want to make sure that what you are committing yourself to is something that speaks to you specifically. Uh, and after that, we intend to have it as an ongoing program where we'll follow up with you after the fact. We will send you a certificate, and you can treat it as a certificate program for your LinkedIn or your CV. Um, email me at jeff at studentpublish.org to sign up um, and we'll get you started. So Rajiv, a quick question for you. Can I start a Q&A and give people permission to leave if they want to take the break? I'll ask one question of the speakers and um, we'll do the discussion, but if anybody needs to jet out for the, for the break, I think some speakers have to leave too. Um, that's fine. So uh, what, I wanted to, what I wanted to ask is um, stop sharing. So I was struck by um, Charlissa's intro with um, talking about individual versus institutional ethics. And then several of the speakers talked about how um, they had conflicts and they've had to uh, make painful decisions and, and change what they did or put up with odious individuals like in Natalie's case. Um, what I'm wondering is if it's not innate, and I don't know if it always is, how do you make ethics worth it? How do you make it um, uh, your ethical responsibility, something that is uh, feeds into your work and that uh, uh, makes the pain that you go through and the hard choices you go through justifiable? It's worth it. <laughs> um, I would say one thing is, you know, we're, we're here in, in academia, we're here for our students and realizing that we're trying to create a world that's better for them. Uh, this is part of that responsibility. So I don't think it's much of a, a separate thing as it is. It's part of our responsibility in, in our careers. You know, in the last second to last slide, I showed, you know, codes of ethics for a number of different organizations. And all of them have things that, that embody the things that we're talking about as you must do this if you're going to be professional in our field. And I think it's not so much that people, um, are making a sacrifice to doing so, it's that we haven't institutionalized both the negative walk away response and the positive, I've got to make this change that you know Natalie and I both talked about, you know, having to basically not take on the system, but try to work either within it or walk away from the system when it seems corrupted. Um, and I, I, I was very happy to say that I think with respect to Title IX and sexual harassment issues, we are much closer to an acceptable place institutionally than we were uh, even when I was in college, but we're, as you know, we've talked about it, it, we're still far away. You know, we're not at a place where all human beings are treated with dignity throughout their uh, lifetime career and educational experience. And that's just, that's part of our mission, you know, whatever our field. If anyone else wants to jump in, uh, or if an audience member wants to say something, feel free to un unmute and have that. This is the uh, informal part of the discussion. Uh, 
All right. Well, if no one else is coming in, and feel free to interrupt me. I mean, I'll say that as, as an IT professional in my day job, um, you know, there have been a number of times when I've had to work for organizations uh, running websites that were for groups that I did not support, and in some a few cases, I completely opposed. Um, and I had to come up with a decision because I have a professional ethic of doing my best work at all times, and a personal ethic of you know not promoting the organization that uh, wanted to drill for oil in the, in the uh, Alaska National Reserve. So, um, one, so one, of the, one of the ways that I split the difference was I realized that there is a way to do professional, my professional best work where everything was high quality, but not necessarily put in the level of creativity. Like I, I, I'm, I'm also a professional writer, so I'll do line editing of their work. Um, or suggest improvements for the text that was going on the page. And for a few of my clients, I just did the tech work and left off some of the above and beyond uh, features that would improve their communications uh, that, that, I, that I would certainly do for a neutral client and definitely do for, um, for, my, for the pro-social clients that I work for. Um, the other thing I'll say that in, in cybersecurity issues, I've got a lot of clients who call me up looking for when they hire me, a uh, perfect security. They want to. They want to go to bed at night feeling that there's absolutely no way that they can get into their site. And ethically, I have to tell them that's impossible. That uh, if they catch the attention of the Russian government or uh, North Korea or the United States, uh, there's really nothing that can be done on a budget that they're presenting with that that will keep that will keep them safe from the NSA. Um, but what we do is we discuss the um, uh, we discuss who their most likely threats are, uh, and come up with the program that it fits within their budget that allows them to sleep at night. Because it turns out that what they don't need they don't need one hundred percent security. What they really need is assurance that they've done the best they could, and that all reasonable threats are dealt with. And then then the work is defining the word reasonable. Uh, and coming up with ways, usually it's just a question of making sure that human error doesn't, uh, uh, isn't, isn't an easy way for them to uh, expose information because that's usually how it's done. So seeing no other comments, I'm about to close the session, but if any of the speakers wanna add something. Actually, I, I do have a question if we don't, if we have a second. Sure. Um, I understand that Pugwash has these, uh, these, these required dues. What does that money go towards? So the the money goes to into a fund that that is meant to support future student programs, uh, and right now we're the membership program is new. We're still getting off the ground. Um, we want to see our members organized into chapters, and we want to see uh, more affiliates and more events coming in. Coming in, um, the twelve dollar dues for students is mainly just to feel that there's some uh, investment in the organization. It's meant to be a nominal fee. Uh, most of our funding comes from alumni dues, which are which are much higher and op which which are higher and optionally uh, can be a donation of whatever they want what they want to give. Um, ultimately, the funding it, when we learn of new programs and when we run our new programs, the funding is going to go out the door for that. Um, we we maintain a, a our our operational budget uh, in terms of programmatic versus uh, overhead expenses. I think came out to eighty percent last year. Uh, and so far, it's, it's over 90% for this year because, you know, COVID, we haven't, we haven't spent much money. Um, so basically, the, the, it's funding for future programs. And uh, we, do not look for, we do not look to students to be our uh, financial backers right now. Uh, but certainly part of the membership program is that we want to bequeath to our successors running the organization uh, the group of you in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, who will be the alumni who might donate a little bit more. So it's a, a combination of um, involvement now, but also uh, a certain amount of mercenary thinking for the future of the health of the organization. And the other thing that's key here is that we deliberately take membership dues um, in order to, like right now, we, we don't have any grant funding and we don't have any immediate interest in seeking grant funding which means that we work with other nonprofits and other organizations, uh, we are not in competition for, with your phone, funders and donors. Um, we can work with you in, in 
uh, complete confidence that you can take all the credit you need to when you file your 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 paperwork with the with the granting organization. Um, you can take full credit for the work we've done together, and and you're not going to hear from us saying, uh, "Oh no, we have to prove to our funders that we've done the work as well." Um, our funders have different motivations, and we satisfy satisfy them in different ways. Does that answer your question, Jeremy? Yes, thank you. It's good to know what Pugwash is up to programmatically. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add briefly on your question, Jeff. Um, I think part of what makes it possible to have a career that's not linear in, in one side of the pipeline and out the other is good mentorship, which is something with the that you mentioned with the pledge um, and it has been a focus for Pugwash. So um, I sent an email to a close mentor essentially saying, I'm gonna leak from a pipeline. I'm afraid you're gonna be disappointed in me. And the response was I'm not disappointed in you and I'm proud, I'm proud of you. And I'm gonna be cheering from the sidelines and doing whatever I can to help you. So I think, again, that's, that's about institutional culture and then individual responsibility as well. So people feel supported in those um, difficult decisions. Yeah, I, I wanna add that the mentorship works in both directions. Um, one of the reasons that we organized, that one of the reasons that we're organizing these online um, uh, office hours for the pledge program is that we're listening as much to what the people who are taking the pledge now are coming in with their concerns and their issues because we can change the pledge program you know, on an ongoing basis. Like we're gonna organize groups of people, but for the next group, we can give them different guidelines, uh, maybe different required readings, um, although most of it is self-guided. But we can change the pledge program as we go to answer more effectively the reasons people are coming into the program. And if people want to join now, we're just launching the new the new pledge program with the study course. Uh, people who come in now will be on the ground floor of being involved and being and uh, helping to set that up while it's still effectively in beta uh, before we've had a chance to really see the effects are. So um, I would love to see SDS global people uh, joining in on that and 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 contributing to to our work and contributing to um, re really having a a, a major. Uh, uh, steering position on how that how that pledge goes forward because we've been doing it for 40 years. The purpose of the study program is to make sure it has teeth, make sure it has weight, because um, we we don't want it to just be people signing up, uh, like a, a slacktivism signing up, you know, signing a petition then forgetting it the next day. We want to make sure that you remember it in the future. And Charlissa's, you know, her research found people that it really had affected, but that was a self selection issue. I think a lot of people who signed it might not have really taken it with them for more than a little while after the, after the pledge. Um, Shalissa, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. We reached out to people uh, to try to sample. We reached out to former chapter leaders and people who had been very engaged uh, because we were wondering for people who took it very seriously and integrated it into their careers and even their identities, what did that end up looking like in their career path? So that was our research design, but I think there's a lot of room in the future to um, look at what lower level um, participation means, um, but probably actually the way that you're approaching it is more effective, which is to try to tailor it individually and make sure that it does really stick because I suspect the research would find has a much less um, lesser impact if you just sign the petition and, and move on. So yeah, I, I've had some reservations about the pledge approach, but I think this is a, a really great way of doing it where it's individually tailored and it's integrated into mentor mentorship. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dave and all panelists uh, for your wrap. wonderful presentation. I, will be at, I think we, we need to wrap at this point. Uh, if you have a last sentence or so, please uh, let's, let's move ahead and wrap up, Jeff and everyone. Yeah, I, the last thing is I want to thank SD Global for, for giving us this platform. Uh, and if anybody sees uh, something in Pugwash that, if, that interacts with your own work um, or, or needs a platform to, to, uh, to do the kind of things we do, then you know, come join us. Thank you. Thank you very much.